good evening all so i hope you're all uh, staying good and uh, you're all preparing for your exams and today we are going to start with the day 7 of surgery i think uh, these topics today whatever we are going to discuss are very very important topics again as i repeat you i am just concentrating only on the topics which will be asked in your exam so whatever we are reading uh, in the day i want you all to revise it at night and sleep because these points you will be useful for you till your uh, medical profession you are going to be practicing it's it's a general topic which every uh, specialized uh, faculties or every specialized uh, medical professionals has to know okay so that's why you are reading all these subjects in the mbbs okay so let's start with the day 7 topic today we are going to talk about the ileostomy colostomy then we are going to talk about the short bowel syndrome then crohn's disease ulcerative colitis diverticular disease inches classification pus jagers disease and fab syndrome hntcc right side and left side at ca okay cancer and apr and lar then we will be talking about the vessels ligated in the right ali hemicolostomy and the nerve injuries that is going to be following your apr and knee gross regimen to begin with first what is stoma okay a stoma abdi nama sonno na i'll show you a uh, pictures also so see here so you're going to have your large intestine you're going to have your small intestine okay so you are small just imagine your small intestine is going to come and join okay so nama it's going to come and join in the right side ascending colon cecum la vandu join aagi ascending colon transverse colon descending colon sigmoid rectum anus so ipdi da ungaloda entire git is going to run So, if I, this is like, what you are concerned about, no, so either when there is going to be any obstruction, or whenever there is going to be any air dynamic disease. So, yesterday we discussed about the air dynamic uh, bowel obstructions. So, whenever there is going to be air dynamic bowel obstruction, what you have to do is you wanted to make sure the feces is going to come out. How we are going to make sure that feces is going to come out? We are going to keep a opening. Either we can take the ileum and open it out. or we can take the colon and open it out okay so if your ileum is normal if colon is abnormal the point where the colon is becoming abnormal for example your ascending colon is fine but your descending colon is not working your transverse colon is not working due to some muscular nervous problem ganglion yesterday we discussed right a dynamic paralytic ileus so whenever there is going to be such a problem what we do is we are going to open that uh, intestine outside the skin okay in the skin la vandha nam opening veppo okay va so opening which we will be using a euro bag or there are specialized bag for that so bags which nam vand collection pandrom right so there are two types of uh, there are two types of stomas number one you have your ileostomy number two colostomy what is the difference between this ileostomy and colostomy see your ileostomy is going to have higher output okay liquids are more common than your solid because ileum ileum is going to be having a liquids more commonly because ileum la da absorption nadakanum okay va so ileum la problem irukana nadal ma ileum lende apdiye velila vidrom okay any portion of your ileum if it is going to be a problem then what we do is we are going to put a ileostomy so there is going to be increased amount of fluid and electrolyte so what is going to be the problem in these patients so after this ileostomy you have to give a supplements you have to give a supplements of your uh, electrolytes okay va so electrolyte supplementation pannu okay so then only you can keep up the nutritional deficiencies uh, in a correct checkpoint okay and there's increased risk of skin excoriation and uh, very importantly you are going to give a pouting so there is a two things you you call it as a flush you call it as pouting so pouting na unga skin ku mele eduth flap mai vechi nama vekkirudhu so that is called as pouting that is made in the ileostomy whereas your colostomy it is going to be a less output so whenever there is a less output solids and semi solid because this is going to be from your colon and whenever there is a problem in the transverse colon or your sigmoid colon okay so there will be a reduced amount of fluid there will be a reduced amount of electrolyte so inge electrolyte abnormalities nam very common ah paaka matom and there is a decreased risk of skin excoriation and flush with skin so you are going to put a flush with skin i'll show you the images okay so just see this is going to be a colostomy this is a image i took from a facebook page of dr rohan sir and he has he, he has wonderfully demonstrated the different colostomy so this there are actually different types of colostomy why i have taken this picture is there are actually different types of colostomy to be very specific so either you are going to have a single barrel barrel colostomy that is going to be a stoma this stoma can be single barrel 
or it can be double barrel or it can be loop stroma. What is single barrel, double barrel, loop stroma? See here, you have colostomy. The colostomy is the end. Okay, where is a single end? You are going to take it out. Then you are going to call it as a single barrel colostomy. The main thing is that the sigmoid colon is a problem. Whenever there is a problem with the sigmoid colon, okay, paralytic ileus, then we will keep opening at the uh, at this ascending, ascending transversal and alarm, no, descending colon. Let us have a well Double barrel abdinana, a transverse colon, renda cut penny. We are going to keep two ends separately. You are going to take it out. We are not going to join it together. We are going to separately take it out. That is called as double barrel. Whereas in your loop stroma, what you do is you are going to join it together and you are going to take it out as a single opening. That is called as your loop stroma. Okay. And if you can see here, this is going to be your end colostomy. I told you one thing, right? Ely colostomy is elatalime. In all your colostomy, okay, what you are going to do is you are going to have a flesh like barrel. Uh, what will be there? Can someone recall and tell me whether you will be having a flesh like barrel or you are going to have a yes, yes, come on, put it in the chat box. What is going to be? I told you, yes, pouting. So you do pouting in you do flesh in what you do pouting in what? So pouting is done in your ileostomy. And fleshing with skin is done in your colostomy. This point very, very important. You need to remember. Okay. So, fleshing is done in the colostomy. Okay. Very clear. And next, if you're going to see, this is a picture of, uh, this is going to be a summary box taken from your belly and love. So, stomos, they can be mainly a colostomy or it can be a ileostomy. They can be temporary or they can be permanent. Temporary or defunctioning stomas are usually fashioned as a loop stomas. And ileostomy is going to be spouted, whereas your colostomy is going to be fleshed. Ileostomy effluent is going to be liquid, whereas colostomy effluent is going to be a solid. Ileostomy patients are more likely to develop fluid and electrolyte abnormality. And ileostomy is usually cited in the right iliac fossa, whereas your end colostomy usually it will be present in the left iliac fossa. This is what everything, whatever given in your uh, Bailey and Love, I have tabulated it and I have given you. Okay, you can read this tabular column regarding stomas. If at all they ask you a question, you will be very thorough in that. And this is again a picture of your end ileostomy. Okay, so what are going to be the complications of uh, all these stoma? Creating a stoma, what is going to be the complications that are going to be arised? Number one, okay, you're going to most common, both in your ileostomy and colostomy, it is going to be skin excoriation. Skin excoriation is going to be most common. And most common long-term complication in your colostomy, if you're going to ask me, that is going to be parastromal hernia. What you will do in parastomal hernia, you will do a mesh repair for them. And what is going to be, which uh, colostomy is going to be more commonly having this parastomal hernia? You will be having that loop colostomy more than your end colostomy. Fluid and electrolyte abnormality will be there. Of course, that is very important, especially in the ileostomy than your colostomy. And you may have prolapse, you have a, you can have a retraction, you can have necrosis, you can have ischemia, you can have stenosis, fistulation, bleeding, and all these things are the complications of your stoma. Okay, once you understand that, next question which we have to discuss is going to be your fecal fistula. What is fecal fistula? So fecal fistula na na na. So our fistula's opening will be there, and uh, that opening either they're going to be having a spontaneous closure or they might not have spontaneous closure. If spontaneous closure happens, that means that the wall defect is going to be very small. That means entric wall defect is going to be less than one centimeter. So fistula tract more than two centimeter and no friend factor. What is this friend factor? I will tell you and low output. So less than 200 ml per day you're going to have. And uh, if there is no spontaneous closure, that will be literally help you to find that the entric wall defect is more than one centimeter and your fistula tract is very small or uh, less than two centimeter and you're going to have a friend factor with high output. What is this friend factor? F stands for foreign body, R stands for radiation, I stands for inflammation and infection, interstitial bowel disease, E stands for epithelialization of your fistula tract, N stands for neoplasm and D stands for distal obstruction. Okay, how do you manage this patient? Remember it has SNAP management. What is the SNAP protocol? S stands for skin excoriation and sepsis control. That will be our first priority. Followed by the nutrition, then anatomical delineation will be done and you're going to plan for a surgery. Okay, next we are going to have a very important topic that is going to be a short bubble syndrome. What is short bubble syndrome? From the name itself, it is going to be very clear that the bubble is going to be very short. How, how much very short? 
I can tell it is less than 200 centimeter of small intestine. So it's going to be less than 200 centimeter of small intestine. And you're going to have two types. One is a secretion and other is a absorption. What is secretion? When the net uh, amount is going to be less than 100 centimeter, that is going to be your secretion type of short bowel syndrome. When the uh, bowel is going to be more than 100 centimeter, that is going to be a absorption type of syndrome. What will be the problem in this uh, secretion absorption type of syndromes that are going to be present in your short bowel? Malabsorption will be there. So, you know, surface area will be easier to absorption. So, surface area will be easier. So, now absorption will be difficult. So, malabsorption will be there. And you are going to experience, you are going to have a diarrhea in the patient. And weight loss will be there. And bacterial overgrowth is possible. What are going to be the causes? Number one, SMA embolism. What is SMA embolism? It is nothing but there is going to be a short mesentric. Uh, you are going to have your vein, right? So, superior mesentric artery. That superior mesentric artery may have embolism. That is the most common cause. And you may have a Crohn's disease and trauma. Crohn's disease, trauma. That is also going to be an important cause. So, what is going to be the management? So, management is going to be total parenteral nutrition. Total parenteral nutrition. Then, small intestine transplantation. Small intestine transplantation. Then, teduglutide. What is teduglutide? Teduglutide is GLP-2 analog. Teduglutide is GLP-2 analog. Okay, well, so, bowel strengthening procedures are done. There are two types of bowel strengthening procedure, guys. Number one, BNC protocol. Number two, step protocol. BNC protocol, we are going to increase the length of the bowel. Step protocol, we are going to increase the transit time. We are going to increase the time so that there is more amount of absorption. So, short bowel, we are going to increase the length of the bowel. Now, the main problem is the absorption problem. So, malabsorption. So, we are going to absorb the time we are giving. So, they are going to increase the transit time. Next, you are going to have a very important question that is going to be a lower GI hemorrhage. So, most common cause of massive hemorrhage in the lower GI is going to be your diverticulosis. I want you to understand this. So, diverticulosis, we although we call it as diverticulosis, what is the problem is this is going to be only mucosa involved. So, we can call it as a false diverticula. And most common site involved here is going to be your sigmoid. Fourth to fifth decade of life, like you will be seeing, and it is associated with constipation. Right colon is more involved compared to your left colon. So bleeding again, superior mesenteric artery will be more commonly involved. Or superior mesenteric artery involved, or right will be more involved than your left. And uh, management is going to be angioembolization. You are going to stop the bleeding. Okay, so an angioembolization, then definitive surgery followed by resection can be done. Diverticulitis, itis, there's an infection or inflammation. So, this is going to present with a pain in abdomen, diarrhea, and there is going to be increase in the TLC, total leukocyte count. And uh, you're going to avoid colonoscopy for this patient and barium studies, uh, avoid pannu. and uh, investigation of choice is going to be CECT. In the inchi staging, where the inchi staging is actually a very important question that can be asked as a short note. Okay, so what is inchi staging? Stage 1, na, there is a colonic infection. I already told you this diverticulitis is an infection. Okay. So, on the infection, in the log spread dog, you are going to give it a, you are going to give it a stage, that is called as your inchi staging. Stage 1 is going to be colonic infection along with pericolic abscess. Colonic infection with pericolic abscess, you call it as stage 1. Stage 2 is colonic infection plus pelvic abscess. So, colonic infection with pericolic abscess is 1. The colonic infection with pelvic abscess is one. So, if you have a pigtail catheter, you are going to drain. I already told you, any abscess in your body, any abscess, you are going to give a pigtail catheter. Okay. And third one, if it is going to be a purulent peritonitis, if it is going to be a purulent peritonitis, or if it is going to be a fetal peritonitis, it's going to be a fatal peritonitis. It's fatal peritonitis. Okay. So, either purulent peritonitis or if it is going to be a fatal peritonitis, what are you going to do? You're going to go for the Artman's procedure. I think we have already discussed about the Artman procedure in the previous video. If not, kindly go and check it out. And now moving on towards the second important cause of uh, bleeding, lower GI bleeding is going to be angiodysplasia. Angiodysplasia is uh, commonly seen in the elderly patient, 5th to 6th decade, right side again more involved than your left side and this is going to be most commonly seen in the cecum. Diverticulosis, we saw it is most commonly seen in the sigmoid and this is most commonly seen in the cecum. Okay, dilated arterioles will be present and it is associated with the IDES syndrome. What is IDES syndrome? Angiodysplasia along with aortic stenosis. So, treatment is going to be colonoscopy, capsule endoscopy you are going to do. Okay, and followed by it, you are going to give a coagulation.
okay and uh, what is going to be the management management is acute lower gi bleeding if you are going to have a case so first you're going to check whether there's active bleeding or not whether there's going to be a hypovolemic shock if the patient is going to have hypovolemic shock then you're going to take a ct ct angiogram and you're going to take for embolization after embolization after ct angiogram you're going to get a patient treated after a few time a few days you can go for the colonoscopy and you can confirm okay you can go for colonoscopy and you can confirm if it is going to be bleeding if it is continue to bleed then you have to take up for the surgery similarly if there is no shock feature okay you are going to see a significant bleeding you can take it for the colonoscopy okay inpatient colonoscopy this is ip okay inpatient colonoscopy okay and then uh, consider for upper gi hemorrhage is normal okay so consider upper gi endoscopy also so if it is going to be normal you are going to discharge the patient now we are going to move towards our next important topic are you ready guys are you all awake shall we begin so this is a very very important topic the one which is we are going to discuss so i want you all to be very attentive i want you all to be very uh, enthusiastically i want you to just concentrate on whatever we are going to study from now onwards okay are you all ready to go into the ibd ibd repeated repeated questions asked in your exam so i want you all to be concentrated about ibd we start now yes so crohn's disease this is most commonly occurring in the age group of 20 to 40 years so let me put it in a tableau column so that it will be easy for you. So the age group of Crohn's is going to be around 20 to 40 years of age. Okay. And uh, second peak occurs. So all diseases will be having one peak. But remember, Crohn's disease is a second peak. It is going to be again peaking at the age of 70 years. It is going to be again peaking at the age of 70 years. And what are the risk factors? Smoking. Smoking is one of the risk factors. And Females are more affected than males. So remember, smoking is one of the risk factor. And then any refined diet, any refined diet is again uh, important risk factors. Okay. And uh, females are having more common than the male. And remember, there are certain genes that plays a major role. What is a gene? NOD2 or CARD15, CARD15. So these are the two genes that are going to be playing a role in the uh, Crohn's disease uh, pathogenesis and now moving on towards the ulcerative colitis ulcerative colitis usually occurs at the age group of 25 to 40 years and remember this is going to be more common in male compared to that of the female whereas your Crohn's disease is most commonly occurring in the female whereas your ulcerative colitis will be occurring in male more common than female and remember a very very important point smoking is a protective factor for ulcerative colitis smoking is protective factor protective factor for ulcerative colitis there is no second peak here there is no second peak in your ulcerative colitis okay very important and uh, coming back towards your uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis remember uh, now we are going to talk about the lesions so these are the uh, main important points as far as a pathogenesis is concerned now let's discuss about the lesions okay so how your lesions of your uh, Crohn's disease is going to be there so Crohn's disease it can involve okay it can involve any part okay it can involve any part of your intestine any part of the intestine not just intestine but remember it can involve any part from your git okay or from your oral cavity to your anus cavity anal okay wow. so oral to anal in the crohn's disease can occur whereas in your ulcerative colitis it is going to be starting from your rectum. It starts from your rectum. It is going to move pan colitis. It can, it can, it is going to involve entire uh, large bowel. Okay, pan colitis, and this is called as this pattern is called as backwash ileitis. Backwash ileitis. It is going to be called as backwash ileitis, and this is going to be continuous spread. This is going to be having a continuous spread, whereas you are. Uh, Crohn's disease is going to be it's going to be like a cobblestone appearance and we will call it as cobblestone appearance why because this is going to be having a skip lesions this is going to have a skip lesions very very important and you have to remember that rectum is paired here rectum is paired this also I want you all to remember 
So what you have to remember? Rectum is paired in this condition. So rectum is paired here, whereas anger rectum is the first thing that is going to get involved. Okay, wow. and which is going to be the most common area where this is going to, uh, your Crohn's disease is going to occur. Most commonly, it is going to be occurring in the terminal ileum. Very important, terminal ileum. Okay, so the relatively your rectal is paired. Anal involvement is going to be more common and uh, your terminal ileum is going to be the most common place. Okay, very important, Crohn's disease. And uh, you have to remember that this is going to be a transmural involvement. This is going to be a transmural inflammation. Transmural inflammation. Whereas if you're going to see your ulcerative colitis, ulcerative colitis is going to involve only your mucosa, mucosa and your submucosa. It is going to involve your mucosa and your submucosa only. That is why we call this as a pseudo polyp. We call this as a pseudo polyp. It is a very important point you must remember. And here you can see toxic megacolon. Toxic megacolon is very common here. Toxic megacolon is very common. Okay. And crypt abscess will be present. So you will be having a crypt abscess in your ulcerative colitis. I'll just revise it back. Don't worry. So, cryptopsis will be present. And remember, you have certain, uh, since this is going to be a transmural inflammation, so what all you will be having because of that, you will be having strictures. The more commonly, you're going to have stricture. And number two, colovesical. Colovesical more than your colo vaginal fistula. So you will be having a fistula which is going to be colovesical compared to that of colovaginal. Okay, very important. And you will be having creepy fat. Okay, creeping fat. So you will be having creeping fat and non-caseating granuloma can be seen. Non-caseating granuloma. So you will be having non-caseating granuloma. Very, very important. Okay. So, when this is going to yield, it is going to form stricture. It is going to form colovesical or colovaginal fistula and you will have an increased mesentric fat that is going to be appearing in creasing, uh, creeping fat and you have non-caseating granuloma. This non-caseating granuloma is there, right? That is going to give you the Typical cobblestone appearance. So you will be learning cobblestone appearance. How many of you are following uh, your Ramdas Naik and Arshid Balu for your medicine? Or Ramdas Naik in your pathology? Probably you would have learned some mnemonic they have given in the form of a picture. I still remember in the Ramdas Naik they have given a picture where C, 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 creeping fat, uh, uh, cobblestone appearance. Uh, so, yellame C layer. Okay, wow. So, on the Madri, they will be like uh, framing a mnemonic and giving. So, understand basic concept, understand, but it is going to be very easy. So, this kiplishan sargo. So, on a it's going to be a cobblestone appearance and it's a non caseating grand loma, creepy fat, transmural involvement. Since all your muscles, layers is involved you are going to have stricture colovesical fistulas and everything okay and how is going to be your clinical features here so remember the clinical features will be it is going to mimic your appendicitis it is going to mimic appendicitis okay well appendicitis mimic panno then abdominal uh, pain abdominal pain and diarrhea very important. Abdominal pain and diarrhea are going And in here, your clinical features will be bloody diarrhea. Okay, there will be a bloody diarrhea. And moving on to talk about the radiological investigations. Moving on to talk about the radiological investigation. What is the radiological features you will be seeing in your uh, Crohn's disease? In Crohn's disease, radiological picture, radiological features you are going to see is number one, after ulcer, after ulcer and number two you are going to have string sign of counter string sign of counter okay counter and what is going to be the radiological feature you are going to see in your ulcerative colitis ulcers and you are going to have a toxic megacolon you're going to have toxic mega colon toxic mega colon it is very very important and what how, is, how the severity is going to be there remember the severity is going to be uh, clearly given by modified Montreal classification. Okay, wow. so the severity of your Crohn's disease, it is given by modified Montreal classification. So I think I don't want you to remember that and all. Similarly, your ulcerative colitis is also going to have, depending upon the number of stools you are going to pass per day, you divide into mild, moderate, severe, fulminant, etc. 
okay so i think this is more than enough so don't complicate things so in the features ellame eludhinenga na aduthathu how you are going to treat the patient so patient unga eda varanga na what is going to be a treatment of choice for these patients treatment of choice appdi nam paathona remember the first one what you are going to give what is going to be the treatment of choice is going to be uh, steroids medical management you are going to give steroids and 5 asa derivative okay you are going to give 5 asa derivative and steroids first after giving this you go for the surgery okay when you are going to go for surgery okay it depends whether it's going to be a crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis if it is a crohn's disease okay conservative resection is done conservative resection and if it is going to be the if it is going to be your uh, ulcerative colitis you will do a total procto colectomy procto colectomy and along with it you will give a ileo anal pouch anastomosis pouch anastomosis okay this is what you are going to do and uh, what is this asa 5 asa i thought someone will be asking me is sulfa salicin guys sulfa salicin is your 5 uh, asa derivative and apart from it you can also go for some uh, monoclonal antibodies monoclonal antibodies also what monoclonal antibodies you know number 1 infliximab infliximab or you can go for vedolizumab vedolizumab what is the advantage of using this so your infliximab is a monoclonal antibody that is specifically targeting your perianal disorders in your crohn's disease and your vedolizumab is going to be against your integrins so your monoclonal antibody against your integrins therefore these two drugs are used okay so you have a so called approach that is called a step up approach and step down what is step up medicines are stepped up adding your monoclonal agents and later as required and what is step down steroids or monoclonal agents okay given from starting and gradually tapered for quick and effective control okay wow. and then what is going to be the indications of surgery when do you perform surgery what is going to be the indications okay what is going to be your indications can someone put in the chat box what is going to be the indication what are the indications you know number 1 when there is no response to medical management when there is more response to medical management or number 2 side effects to steroid when there is a side effects to steroids number 3 when there is complication when there are complications like your strictures like stricture fistula or malignancy when there are complications like your stricture fistula and malignancy and fourth one except for your carcinoma conservative resection is only done uh, why do you do conservative resection also because conservative resection if you are not doing that may lead to short bowel syndrome that may lead to short bowel syndrome and that is the reason why we perform uh, this conservative management conservative surgery also now what are the extra intestinal manifestation okay what are the extra intestinal manifestation you can have so extra intestinal manifestation i'll show you as a picture that will be like uh, i think uh, that will be interesting for you to read also one minute let it let them uh, load down okay just hold on so extra intestinal manifestation enna actually varalam what do you think okay so this is going to be your creeping fat okay i i told you right where do you see the creeping fat you see that okay you see creeping fat i'll show you creeping fat also this is going to be your creeping fat this you will be seeing in your crohn's disease so creeping fat enga paapenga you will see in the crohn's disease crohn's disease la nama creeping fat paathona i think spelling wrong one minute c r o h n crohn's disease okay in the crohn's disease you will be seeing this creeping fat and uh, this is nothing but your pseudo polyp where do you see pseudo polyp guys where do you see pseudo polyp pseudo polyp you will be seeing in the ulcerative colitis ulcerative colitis so in ulcerative colitis you saw pseudo polyps okay and your creeping fat you will be seeing in your crohn's disease and this is again another picture of your creeping fat and you can see the fat globules that are present when you are going to do a histopathological uh, biopsy and this is again a uh, us is going to be a toxic mega colon can you see a this is your toxic mega colon where do you see toxic mega colon i told you already so where do you see toxic mega colon toxic mega colon is seen in 
which condition in x ray eduth paakrappa toxic megacolon ulcerative colitis remember ulcerative colitis more than your crohn's okay so you will be uh, seeing this in the ulcerative colitis more than your crohn's okay so how much uh, diameter is going to be your large bowel large bowel is going to be more than 6 cm diameter so diameter will be more than 6 cm and you will be having abdominal pain you will be having a fever you will be having rise in the tlc you will be having rise in the tlc okay so these are again other image okay these are also other image where you can see stitches can you see here so there is going to be a stitches present stitches present so edema or fibrosis with ulcerated mucosa which is going to resemble your uh, flayed string appearance that is called uh, that is going to be present in your crohn's disease again that is going to be present in your crohn's disease string sign of contour so this will be also present in the tuberculosis so tuberculosis again you will be finding this and this is your aftas ulcer so this is going to be aftas ulcer where do you find aftas ulcer again in your crohn's disease you're going to find aftas ulcer this other way is called as target sign this other way is called as target sign so there are mucus ulcers with surrounding translucent mound of edema that is going to be called as your aftas ulcer and we can see here so this is your again your aftas ulcer only so mucosal ulcers are going to be present surrounding a translucent mound of edema and uh, these are the summary uh, given from your uh, Bailey and Love. What is going to be the principle of management for ulcerative colitis? Most patients are maintained, maintained on optimal medical therapy. Acute severe colitis requires multidisciplinary management. Toxic dilation or impending complications should be suspected if the patient develops abdominal tenderness or distension. Even though Crohn's disease and you are going to perform surgical treatment to medical treatment. But however, surgery should not be delayed when there is a clear indication. So Crohn's disease is a chronic relapsing disease with high likelihood of reoperation. Surgeons must take every responsible effort and preserve bowel length and sphincter function. So, shared decision making with patient to accommodate the treatment preferences must be done. And this is going to be again extra intestinal manifestations which are going to be present in your uh, inflammatory bowel disease. First one, dermatologically, you're going to have uh, what are the dermatological extra intestinal manifestation? Number one, erythema nodosum, pyoderma gangriosum, erythema nodosum, pyoderma gangriosum, and oral ulcers. Oral ulcers are specific on your aphthous stomatitis. And epitobiliary, you're going to have primary sclerosing cholangitis. And ophthalmologically, you're going to have episcleritis, scleritis, uveitis, iritis, conjectivitis. Hematologically, you're going to have anemia, thrombocytosis, renal and nephrolithiasis, calcium oxalate, and musculoskeletal, it's going to be ankylizing spondylitis. What are the conditions which uh, do not improve on surgery? You have to know this. What are going to be the surge conditions where the, there is no improvement even after surgery? Ready to Conditions which do not improve on surgery. Number one, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Primary sclerosing cholangitis. I'll write the full form also. Primary sclerosing cholangitis. And number two, ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis, ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, so that is going to be your two things which you have to remember, the condition which do not improve on surgery. Okay, surgery for ulcerative colitis, all extra intestinal manifestation will be resolving except your primary sclerosing cholangitis and ankylosing spondylitis that you should be very clear. Okay, now we have seen about the small bowel syndrome. We have seen about the diverticular disease, diverticulosis, uh, any uh, you have seen about the inch staging also we have completed. Then we have completed low G, lower GI hemorrhage also. Now we are going to move towards a very, very important topic, colorectal polyp. Shall we move towards the colorectal polyp, guys? Colorectal polyp is again very important. Colorectal cancer is important. Bowel TB is again very, very important. So we are going to start with uh, one by one. So before moving to that, uh, I just want you to show this uh, slide also. What is this slide? This slide is again taken from your Bailey and Love. So this is giving you the distinguishing features of colitis and your uh, Crohn's disease. So in the points are the common people will be expecting you because this is from Bailey and Love. Very simple. Okay, this is from Bailey and Love. Therefore, they will be expecting. Okay, this is going to be your surgeries that are going to be performed. This is going to be the surgeries that are going to be performed uh, in your uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So I already told you when it is going to be your Crohn's disease or what is going to be done in ulcerative colitis. Colitis, pro colotomy. 
okay they will be doing okay so what do they do can someone tell me in the chat box i told you right what is going to be the surgery proctocolectomy so total proctocolectomy will be done along with it iliorenal pouch anastomosis will be done iliorenal pouch anastomosis will be done this is going to be your proctocolectomy and iliorenal anastomosis is done okay this is going to be a very important and this is your diverticular disease i told you about diverticular disease in the starting right this is the x-ray image of diverticular disease this is going to be diverticulosis so i told you two things diverticular disease we discussed then diverticulosis diverticular the diverticular disease in other most commonly sigmoid colon only will be effective whereas in diverticulitis okay it's not just sigmoid colon sigmoid colon nalla irukum so sigmoid colon thavara meedi ellame affect aagum so adha avanga diverticulosis so diverticulosis or specialty enna na it is a saw tooth appearance saw tooth appearance that is a very important point you need to understand okay so next is going to be your this is your pericolic abscess we discussed about pericolic abscess in the stage 1 okay in the in case stage 1 in case stage 1 so you are going to have your colonic inflammation along with pericolic abscess this is going to be a ct image of pericolic abscess and this is your aberrising pattern we are going to dis we have discussed aberrising pattern this is your aberrising pattern this is a perioral melanosis this is a perioral melanosis this is agates classification all these things we are going to discuss it in the meanwhile okay till now any doubt is there you can put in the chat box okay this shall we move towards the next one that is going to be a colorectal polyp now we are going to start with a very important topic that is going to be a colorectal polyp what is colorectal polyp just put the heading colorectal polyp so what happens colorectal polyp la so either you are going to have a inflammatory condition either it is going to be inflammatory either it is going to be inflammatory number 2 it is going to be amartomous either it is going to be amartomous amartomous amartomatous or third one it can be uh, adenomatous polyp adenomatous polyp so what are the three things inflammatory polyp amartomatous polyp or it is going to be a adenomatous polyp what is this inflammatory polyp inflammatory polyp is ulcerative colitis ulcerative colitis is going to be your inflammatory polyp this is going to be no this is going not going to be a pre malignant not pre malignant and then you add adenomatous polyp again this adenomatous polyp it is going to have an increased risk increased risk of turning into a malignancy and villus more than tubular pattern villus more than tubular and there is a increase in number risk with increase in number and increase in size of polyp increase in size of polyp increase in number and increase in size of polyp very important you must know you must remember and uh, you are going to have certain patterns here okay so that patterns will be seen in your amartomatous polyp so amartomatous polyp la moonu paapinga and the moonu me important ana questions that can be asked in your exam potential exam questions number 1 it is going to be your juvenile polyposis syndrome juvenile polyposis syndrome juvenile polyposis syndrome la enna gene mutation SMAD4 gene mutation. It is present in the chromosome 18, and uh, here what you are going to have cancer chance is going to be very high. So there is an increased risk of cancer. So then you are going to have your Cowden syndrome. Cowden syndrome. Then you are going to have Cowden syndrome. So what is your Cowden syndrome? Cowden syndrome. Here you are going to have mutation in PTEN, which is going to be present in the chromosome 10. and most commonly what you are going to see is gi polyp most commonly what you are going to see gi polyps and it is not pre malignant again remember this is not pre malignant this is not pre malignant this is not pre malignant very important and you can also see this in the thyroid and breast cancer you can also see that in the thyroid and breast cancer very important to remember and third one is going to be you also have to remember banyan banyan riley banyan riley ruval kaba ruval kaba syndrome 
ஓகே ஸோ இதெல்லாம் நீங்கள் கேள்வியே பட்டிருக்க மாட்டேங்க பட் திஸ் இஸ் கிவன் இன் யோர் பெய்லி அண்ட் லவ் எதுக்கும் இஃப் அட் ஆல் தி ஆஸ்க் இன் எக்ஸாம் யூ ஷுட் பி ஏபிள் டு ரைட் இட் பிகாஸ் பெய்லி அண்ட் லவ்லேருந்து எது வேணாலும் கேட்கலாம் எக்ஸாமில் ஸோ பேனியன் ரைலி ருவால் கேபா சின்ரோம் பேனியன் ரை பேனியன் ரைலி ருவால் காபா சின்ரோம் அதர்வைஸ் கால்டாஸ் இதுக்கா இன்னொரு நேம் வேற இருக்கு வாட் இஸ் தட் மைரி ஸ்மித் சின்ரோம் நேம்லயே இருக்கு அப்படிதான் so myri smith syndrome so this is going to be nothing but gi polyp this is a gi polyp and this is going to cause penile pigmentation it is going to cause penile pigmentation in addition to gi polyp it can also cause penile pigmentation this you need to remember and last but not least you are going to have a very important syndrome that is going to be your pudes jagger that is going to be your pudes jagger syndrome what is this pudes jagger syndrome pudes jagger syndrome the gene which is going to be involved is stk gene which is going to be involved is stk2 which is going to be present in the chromosome 19 stk2 which is going to be present in the chromosome 19 and most common location of polyp most common location of polyp is going to be jejunum most common location of polyp is going to be jejunum and most common presentation most common presentation is going to be intersusception 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 okay most common uh, location of polyp is going to be a jejunum and most common presentation is going to be intersusception what is going to be pathognomic feature pathognomic feature is a very uh, you know sort of mcq or a favorite point is pathognomic image ede so pathognomic picture is going to be your perioral melanosis i you showed you the picture right just now that is going to be your perioral melanosis perioral melanosis i will again show you the picture and in the histopathology slide how you are going to look that uh, picture you are going to have arbos you are going to have your arborizing pattern you are going to have a arborizing pattern i'll show you arborizing pattern is going to be there and this has a increased risk of increased risk of number 1 pancreatic cancer pancreatic cancer number 2 duodenal adenocarcinoma duodenal adenocarcinoma adenocarcinoma number 3 you can have thyroid cancer thyroid cancer and number 4 you will be having a colonic cancer colonic cancer these are the four variants of cancer which you will be seeing in the amartamatous polyp okay so this is your i'll show you the picture now again so this is your arbor arborizing pattern and this is going to be a perioral melanosis can you see here this is your arborizing pattern and you are going to have a perioral melanosis okay you are going to have a perioral melanosis and this is going to be a agit classification so this is going to be a agit classification which we are going to discuss now okay va so we are going to discuss agit classification now what is agit classification let's see and uh, you need to also understand that any adenomatous conditions okay they are going to be pre malignant in nature any adenomatous condition they are going to be pre malignant in nature okay rendu type a irukalam one adu villous a irukalam illa tubular a irukalam villous a irundha na adu single okay it's going to be single okay and uh, pedunculated polyp a irukum whereas tubular a irundha it's going to be multiple and sessile okay so you have this agit classification very important level 0 means non invasive level 0 means non invasive level 1 means invading through muscularis mucosa but limited to the head of pedunculated polyp it is going to be limited to the head of pedunculated polyp that is the level 1 level 2 na na invading the neck of pedunculated polyp see here okay what is level 1 level 1 na level 0 na non invasive okay what level 1 na it is invading through the muscularis propria it is invading through your muscularis propria one minute yeah it is going to invade through your muscularis propria but limited to the head of pedunculated polyp just your head can you see here can you see here? just your head is going to come into this is your level 1 level 2 means invading the neck of pedunculated polyp if your neck of pedunculated polyp is also involved that is your level 2 and what is level 3 invading the stalk of pedunculated polyp this is your stalk so in the stalk of pedunculated polyp if it is involved that is your level 3 and level 4 when you are going to invade into the submucosa below the stalk 
So when it's going to inhale your submucosa below your stalk, that is going to be your level four. Okay. Along with me, repeat. Level zero, non-invasive. Level one, invading through the muscularis mucosa, but limited to the edge of pedunculated polyp. What is level two? Invading the neck of pedunculated polyp. Level three, invading the stalk of pedunculated polyp. Level four, invading into the submucosa below the stalk of pedunculated polyp. Okay, so what is going to be your treatment of choice? So most commonly your treatment of choice for all your adic polyps, it is going to be endoscopic mucosal resection. If complete resection is done, if you want to completely excise, so you can go for complete excision, repeat after one year. No complete excision. You're going to repeat the investigation every six months and non pedunculated with complete uh, in excision now one year once you're going to see. Okay, so there's an endoscopic mucosal resection. A polyp is going to be identified. And what are you going to perform? You're going to infiltrate. Can you see? Yeah. So first you're going to infiltrate. After infiltrating, you're going to lift it under the muscle flap. So on the muscle flap, you're going to lift it. A diathermy snare is passed. Can you see? Yeah. This is your diathermy snap. You're going to pass the diathermy snap and you're going to uh, completely, you're going to enclose them and you're going to excise it. This is going to be your endoscopic mucosal resection. And now this is a very famous image. This is a very famous image uh, that you need to know. Adenoma and adenoma carcinoma sequence. So what happens basically is, uh, I'll show you this in a full screen that will be giving a good uh, information. Okay, this is your adenoma carcinoma sequence. What happens in your adenoma carcinoma sequence? Normal mucosa is there. Okay, so you're going to have a normal mucosa. This normal mucosa in the presence of APC gene, Okay, so adenomatous polyposis coli gene, it is going to get hyperproliferative epithelium. This hyperproliferative epithelium, so first gene one the APC gene. And the hyperproliferative epithelium is going to be there. This is your hyperproliferative, hyperproliferative epithelium. This is going to get methylated in the presence of beta catenin. In the presence of beta catenin, this is your second it. So one second it is done, that is going to form your early adenoma, early adenoma. This is your early adenoma. But in the early adenoma, also you need some activation that is going to be done by KRAS mutation. So if there is a KRAS mutation, that is going to form intermediate adenoma. This again, this intermediate adenoma requires chromosome 18 like a DCC gene. And the DCC gene it forms a late adenoma. In the late adenoma, finally, you need P53. So there is an APC gene involved. There is going to be a beta catenin gene involved. There is going to be KRAS mutation. There is going to be a P53 mutation. There is going to be a DCC gene mutation. And finally, P53 mutation converts it into carcinoma. So adalime P53 gene when the wild type are na, it forms oncogene induced senescence. Carcinoma in a, when there is going to be a T53 mutation at 17P13. But in addition to it, you also have your SMAD2 and 4 mutation. At least if you are not, you cannot remember everything. Remember this APC gene, beta catenin gene, KRAS gene, P53 gene. In the NAR gene, okay, these four genes you need to understand. Okay, ma. Okay, so now we are going to move towards the first important thing. Now we are going to move towards the first very important thing that is going to be your that is going to be your familial adenomatous polyposis. Okay, can we start with familial adenomatous polyposis? What is this FAP or familial adenomatous polyposis? It is an autosomal dominant. Okay, so mutation is going to be occurred in APC gene. APC gene mutation which is going to be present at the chromosome 5. And what is the pathognomic feature? Pathognomic feature. It is going to be more than 100 adenomatous polyp. More than 100 adenomatous polyp. Okay, ma? and which is going to be the most common site involved. Most common site involved is going to be rectum. Most common site involved is going to be rectum. Remember, FAP, APC gene at chromosome 5, it is going to be more than, you're going to have a more than 100 adenomatous polyp in your colon and most common site is going to be rectum and there is going to be 100% risk of cancer, 100% risk of cancer and what is going to be your surgery done guys? Surgery is going to be total 
proto colectomy proto colectomy okay along with it you are going to do ileo renal ileo anal sorry ileo anal pouch anastomosis very similar to that of done in your ulcerative colitis pouch anastomosis okay va well, anastomosis and what is going to be the variants you are going to have two important variants here number one you can have gardner variant gardner syndrome or number two turcot syndrome turcot syndrome you can have gardner syndrome or you can have turcot syndrome gardner syndrome you can have turcot syndrome what is gardner syndrome you can have familial adenomatous polyposis you can have sebaceous cyst there can be osteoma osteoma there can be desmoid tumor desmoid tumor desmoid tumor the four things which you can actually have is number one familial adenomatous polyposis sebaceous cyst osteoma and dermoid tumor so these are the four tumors which are involved with the gardner's syndrome and turcot syndrome again is going to be familial adenomatous polyposis and you can have some cns tumors what are the cns tumors that are associated with number one you can have gliomas gliomas and number two medulloblastoma medulloblastoma so gliomas and medulloblastomas are most commonly involved okay that you need to understand and there is going to be another one that is called as your muti associated muti associated polyposis m u t y h muti's associated polyposis okay well, what is this muti's associated polyposis it is again very similar it is going to be very similar to familial adenomatous polyposis autosomal recessive in condition there is going to be multiple colonic polyps there can be multiple colonic polyp and considered when apc pathognomic variant is not identified when you cannot identify pathognomic variant this is three to six times high risk of cancer so there are three to six times high risk of cancer very important and you will do a two yearly colonoscopy two yearly colonoscopy you are going to do and surveillance for duodenal adenoma so you are going to surveil for duodenal adenoma duodenal adenoma okay right so i yeah, will let's see the picture this is going to be a familial adenomatous polyposis this is how your picture looks like okay can you see yes so this is your familial adenomatous polyposis and next we are going to say the second thing that is going to be hereditary non-polyposis colonic cancer syndrome so next we are going to see hereditary non-polyposis colonic cancer syndrome that is going to be otherwise called as hnpcc hnpcc otherwise called as lynch syndrome otherwise called as lynch syndrome what is hnpcc or lynch syndrome when there is a mismatch gene repair okay when there is going to be mismatch repair gene defect when there is going to be mismatch repair gene defect when there is a defect in the mlh or msh gene okay mlh or msh gene so mismatch repair gene la edav the problem irundaduna that can give rise to this hnpcc hnpcc is again of two type number 1 lynch 1 and number 2 lynch 2 okay what is lynch 1 this is most commonly seen in colorectal cancer colorectal cancer and what is lynch 2 this is seen in the extra colonic extra colonic na na endometrium la paakala endometrial la paakala namma okay va and what is going to be your amster dam criteria amster dam criteria remember rendu criteria koduthupanga book la amsterdam criteria nu potu they would have given amsterdam 1 amsterdam 2 okay just forget all these things what you are going to do in amsterdam criteria first you are going to rule out familial adenomatous polyposis once you ruled out familial adenomatous polyposis in you then what you are going to do you are going to at least three relatives affected of hnpcc tumors of which at least one should be first degree relative then you are going to search for hnpcc at least three relative and the three relative la vandu pathengana one must be first degree relative first degree relative அப்படி இருக்கணும் தேர்ட் ஒன் வந்து பாத்தீங்கன்னா டூ கான்சிக்யூட்டிவ் ஜென்ரேஷன் அஃபெக்ட் ஆயிருக்கணும் டூ கான்சிக்யூட்டிவ் ஜென்ரேஷன் ஷுட் பி அஃபெக்டட் ஷுட் பி அஃபெக்டட் நம்பர் த்ரீ அண்ட் நம்பர் ஃபோர் அட்லீஸ்ட் ஒன் ஷுட் டெவலப் டியூமர் லெஸ் தேன் பிப்டி இயர்ஸ் அண்ட் அட்லீஸ்ட் ஒன் ஷுட் டெவலப் 
tumor less than 50 years. Then only you can call it as a HNPCC, hereditary non-polyposis colonic cancer syndrome. Okay, wow. are you clear with that? Next, we are going to move towards a very important essay question. Colorectal carcinoma. The last part, okay, wow. the last part of your GIT. GIT I'm not including epitobiliary in your GIT. So the very important part of your uh, your the entire GAT is going to be a colorectal cancer. So I want you all to listen carefully for this colorectal cancer. Okay, well, so in the today's discussion, we have kept uh, till colorectal cancer, isn't it? Uh, we have discussed colorectal cancer, then APR, and uh, we will we'll discuss about Negro's regimen. Yes. So we will discuss till that and we will close it. So what is your colorectal cancer? Those who undergo cholecystectomy, Okay, well, as a higher risk of this colorectal cancer. So, what is going to be the most common site? It's going to be rectum, though we call it as colorectal cancer. Remember, rectum is more common than your rectosigmoid, than your sigmoid. What is going to be your risk factors? So, remember, risk factors. Okay, so what are the risk factors you are going to have? Number one, polyp. Number two, high fat diet. Number three, family history. Number four, diverticular disease. And number five, IBD. So these are the five risk factors. And what are going to be the protective factor? So what are the protective factor? Come on, first one, selenium. Zinc, always selenium, zinc, metformin, aspirin, and eye fiber diet. These are going to be protective factor for your colorectal cancer. For your colorectal cancer. Next, how you are going to screen the patient? See, main problem, main thing is you have to screen the patient. Okay, you are going to screen the patient. So screening, you can use colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, or fecal to occult blood testing, which is very easy among them. Colonoscopy, so screening, I have just put the heading as screening. So three things I am telling in screening. Number one, colonoscopy. Number two, sigmoidoscopy. Number three, fecal occult blood testing. This is easy to do. Fecal adult, uh, fecal occult blood testing. Then I'm easy to do. Am I right? So Adinala, this is, can be done yearly. This you are going to do yearly, every year. Okay, can do yearly. Whereas sigmoidoscopy, yes, it is difficult. So what we are doing is we can do it five years once. Sigmoidoscopy, like usual, of how much you can see? 60 to 90 centimeters you can see. But colonoscopy, you can see almost 110 to 140. But it is very difficult. Nah? So every 10 years, 10 yearly, you are going to see this colonoscopy. When do you start seeing a colonoscopy? 50 years or family history. If there is any family history, then 10 years before the diagnosis of youngest relative. 10 years before diagnosis of Youngest relative, youngest relative, you are going to see the colono, you are going to perform colonoscopy. There is other one nowadays that is called as virtual colonoscopy. What is virtual colonoscopy? CCT, virtual colonoscopy. What you are going to perform? You are going to perform high resolution CECT. Along with it, you are going to followed by a 3D reconstruction. 3D reconstruction that is a very uh, recent advance that you can do virtual colonoscopy advantages it is has extra better colonic details and better patient compliance but the problem is mucosal details cannot be seen as you see in your actual colonoscopy that is a problem now moving on towards the investigation of choice what is going to be your investigation of choice investigation of choice is going to be colonoscopic biopsy colonoscopic Biopsy is the investigation of choice and you're going to do staging by using a yes, PET scan or CT scan. And for rectal cancer, TNM staging, for TNM staging in your rectal cancer, 
rectal cancer, you will be doing MRI. You have to take MRI with endorectal coil. Endorectal coil, very important. And now you have to know what is the difference between the right-sided and left-sided lesion. I already told you, right? What is the difference between your right-sided and left-sided lesion? You need to know. Right-sided lesion, it is going to be ulceroproliferative growth. Ulceroproliferative growth. The difference between the right side and left side. Right side you are going to have ulceroproliferative growth. Proliferative growth. Okay. Number one, ulceroproliferative growth. In here, you will be having annular growth. You will be having annular growth. Okay. Wow. So in the ulcerative pro ulceroproliferative growth will be having increased bleeding. Okay, it will have increased bleeding, and you will have a iron deficiency anemia, iron deficiency anemia, and you will be having a mass. And there is a altered bowel habit. Altered bowel habit will be present. And this is a late features. Okay. Annular growth, if you are going to see, that is going to have early features. Early feature of what? Early features of your altered bowel habit. Altered bowel habit and your bowel obstruction. Okay, well, so now moving on towards the TNM staging. Remember, TNM staging recent guidelines updated. TNM la recent they have updated certain things that you need to understand. Minimum 12 lymph nodes must be removed for your lymph node staging. So for doing this TNM staging, you need to remove at least minimum of 12 lymph nodes. There's a Bailey update that I want you to note it down. Okay, 12 lymph node must be removed for staging and metastasis to non-regional lymph nodes outside the drainage area of the tumor should be considered as M1A disease. Okay, well, you're going to consider it as a M1A disease. What is M1A? M1A neither solvona when metastasis is confined, it is going to be confined to one organ, to one organ or one site without peritoneal metastasis, without peritoneal metastasis okay so you will be having 16 15 12 10 lymph nodes uh, removed for esophageal stomach uh, breast cancer so i'll just tell you a mnemonic shortly 16 15 12 10 remember like this 16 lymph nodes are removed in the esophageal cancer esophageal cancer la 16 lymph node 15 lymph nodes you will be removing in the stomach cancer okay and 12 lymph node you will be removing the colorectal cancer and 10 lymph node will be removed for biopsy in for staging in your breast cancer. Okay, never forget this 16, 15, 12, 10 rule. 16, 15, 12, 10. Remember 16, 15, 12, 10. Okay, remember this. You should never forget this. 16, 15, 12, 10 rule. Okay, now uh, you also have to remember that N1C, that is going to be no regional lymph nodes are positive. But there are tumor deposits in sub serosa mesentery. Then you call it as N1C. Okay, let's actually see uh, staging. Okay, so T1 staging. Then a tumor invading mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria. That is easy. Remember. I know that T staging is a very problem. But N staging, now what happened is N1 metastasis to 1 to 3 regional lymph nodes. So in the other way, NA, NB, NC, and Muna Prishtanga. So, anger the problem. Okay. So, there is no problem. But where the problem arises is they have actually divided this T3 into T3. Okay. T3 is not a problem. N2 and N3. N1 they divide into N1A. Okay. Then they divide into N1B and they divide into N1C. N1A is one regional lymph node involved. One regional lymph node involved. Okay. What is N1B? One regional lymph node involved. Again, it's a N1B. What is the difference between your N1A and N1B? N1A, if it is going to be metastasis, that is N1A. N1B, there is one regional lymph node involved. What is N1C? One regional lymph node involved. What is N1C? No regional lymph node involved. No regional lymph node involved. But what happens is, there is going to be a tumor deposit. Tumor deposits present in the mucosa, submucosa, mesentery and non-peritoneal pericolic or colic region. What is N2? N2 is metastasis in 4R mode. That is easy. But again, they divide into N2A, 
N to B. What is N to A? Metastasis to 4 to 6 regional lymph node. When, when are you going to call it as N to B? When more than 7, more than or equal to 7 regional lymph nodes are involved. Then comes your N3. Abdingra and the concept of Pudu classification. Like N3A. Okay. N0, N1, N2. N3 per recent is they have removed. Alibala M1, M0. Again, M1 they divide. Again, I told you they divide into M1A, M1B. What is M1A? When it is confined to one organ or site without peritoneal metastasis. Without peritoneal metastasis. What is M1B? M1 being other when it is going to be more than or equal to 2. When it is going to be more than or equal to 2, we have M1, M1B. Okay, wow. that you have to remember. And you have this T4, right? T3 is same, not T4 regular. T4 again you divide into T4A, T4B. What is T4A? T4A now when the tumor is going to be going through the visceral peritoneum. Okay, now what is T4B? When it is going to be directly adherent to the organ, that is going to be T4B. Hope so you are clear with this. But uh, I will tell you one thing. The TNM staging, even if you are not reading, no one is going to ask you. Okay, no one is going to ask you. But what question the people will be asking you is a uh, Duke staging. Okay, Duke staging the questions can be power. What is this Duke staging? Duke staging is going to depend on the uh, depth of the tumor. Duke staging is going to depend on the depth of the tumor. Okay, well, so just imagine like this. Just put like this. This is your A. This is going to be your mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria and serosa. Okay, this is your A. This is going to be your B. This again B2. This is your B1. This is B2. C1. C2. But I am just putting a mark here. I will tell you why I have put a mark here. C1, C2. See, C1, B1, B2, same C1, C2. It's more or less appearing very similar, right? Then what is going to be the difference here? So what the difference is in A, mucosa alone is involved and submucosa is alone involved. Mucosa, submucosa. So in A, what happens? There is going to be mucosa involvement along with it, submucosa involvement. That is going to be your A. And what is in B? So you are going to have a muscle involvement. You will be having a muscle involvement. So muscle involvement, you can divide it into two. One is going to be B1, B2. What is B1? B1 na into muscle layer. Into muscle layer, B2 na complete muscle layer is involved. But the difference here is no lymph node is involved. No lymph node is involved. Okay, well, so that is the important thing. And C is going to be, again, C is going to be a muscle which is going to involve. Muscle involvement will be there. Along with muscle, there is going to be a lymph node involvement. Similarly, you are going to have C1, C2. So, C1 not just into, whereas C2 not complete. Okay, then you are going to have D. D means distant metastasis. D means distant metastasis, distant metastasis. This is what you need to understand. So, Duke staging, I hope so you are, uh, you are just, you will remember this Duke staging forever. Duke staging can be asked as a question because that's now what you can expect from the tongue, but Duke staging, they will be expecting you to remember. Okay, how you are going to manage this patient? So, now we are going to finally move towards how we are going to manage this patient. Management is a very important question. So, I will be concentrating on this management. How you are going to manage this patient? Mainly by colectomy. So, mainly what you are going to do? You are going to do colectomy. So, colectomy, there are different types of resection. Okay, well, colectomy can be done with different types of resection. Colectomy can be done with different types of resection. Okay, let me tell you. Okay, so you are going to have different areas where the tumors are going to be there. Number one, it can be present in the cecum. It can be present in the ascending colon. It can be present in the ascending colon. It can be present in the splenic flexure. Splenic flexure. It can be present in the splenic flexure or it can be present in the sigmoid. Okay, once again, I repeat along with me. Number one, cecum larkalon. It can be present in the ascending colon. It can be present in the splenic flexure. It can be present in the sigmoid. Cecum larkununa, right hemicolectomy. So, procedure, you will go into perform a cecum la cancer and then you go for right hemicolectomy, right hemicolectomy. If it is going to be ascending colon, you will do an extended right hemicolectomy. If it is going to be at the splenic flexure, you do left hemicolectomy, hemicolectomy. 
colectomy. If it is going to be at the sigmoid, you do sigmoidectomy. You do sigmoidectomy. Okay. You perform sigmoidectomy or you perform okay, so and low anterior resection or you perform low anterior resection that is LAR. Okay, well, so you perform low anterior resection. What are the vessels that you are going to ligate in all these things? What are the vessels that you are going to ligate in all these things? Number one, you have to, you are going to ligate iliocolic artery. You are going to ligate right colic artery. You can ligate right branch of middle colic artery. That is going to be in your cecum. In ascending colon, you have to do iliocolic artery, iliocolic artery, number two, right colic artery, right colic artery, number three, middle colic artery, middle colic artery. Okay, and third one, splenic flexure, you're going to perform left colic artery, you're going to anastomose, left colic artery is going to be anastomosed, and number two, left branch of Middle colic artery is anastomosed. Middle colic artery is going to be anastomosed. Okay. So, this is going to be your colon cancers. So, this is going to be overall for colon cancer, what you are going to perform. Very simple if you want to remember. Cecum side la vandhi, edhi supply pannadhi. Cecum side la maina iliocolic artery, right colic artery, right branch of middle colic artery. Adhi kapra abdiya mele vandhi yengana marginal uh, artery of uh, drum. Adhi varu. You are going to have your iliocolic artery is going to be there. Right colic artery, middle branch of colic artery. You have your splenic flexures where you are going to have left colic artery alone and left branch of your middle colic artery. Then coming towards your sigmoid. Maina, you are going to have your left colic. Again, you are going to have left colic, sigmoid and superior rectal artery. Superior rectal artery. Superior rectal artery. Okay, whenever there is going to be a sigmoidal, uh, sigmoidal is a sigmoidectomy is done or LAR. Okay, okay, you're going to perform LAR. What is LAR? Low anterior resection. So, what is low anterior resection? Next question. What is low anterior resection? See here. Okay, so just imagine this is going to be your, this is going to be the area where you're going to have anus. This is going to be your dentate line. This is going to be your dentate line. And uh, this area, just uh, you just divide this. You're going to have your dentate line. And uh, this area, you're going to have above, you're going to have like this. And below, you're going to have like this. So, I'll tell you one by one what I'm just drawing. This is going to be, this is going to be your anorectal line, anorectal line. And this is going to be your verge. This is going to be your verge. Okay. Now, what you have to remember is when I am going to perform a low anterior resection, what are the things I am going to remove? When I perform low anterior resection, I am going to remove the rectum completely. In low anterior resection, what I am going to remove? I am going to remove the rectum completely. Along with rectum, a part of sigmoid, a part of sigmoid is going to be removed. And number three, colo rectal anastom colo anal anastomosis so you're going to remove all these things and what you're going to do you're going to perform a colo anal anastomosis okay wow. so rectamo sigmoid you resect panita you're going to perform a colo anal anastomosis so in the resection yenga pannuvenga abdin pathinga na you're going to perform 5 cm above the verge so this is going to be your verge and above your verge, you're going to perform. So, above your verge, na, in the earth, na, almost in here, 5 centimeters. So, you're in the distance, on the path, na, 2 to 2.5 centimeter. And in the distance, again, this distance will also be again 2 to 2.5 centimeter. 2 to 2.5 centimeter. So, what you're going to perform is you're going to perform this uh, resection at 5 centimeter, more than 5 centimeter from your verge. That is above your anorectal line. So, if there is going to be injury to the... Okay, if you are going to do at this below your anorectal area, you will be injuring, okay, below anorectal area. If you are going to, per, if you are going to perform, what happens basically is you are going to injure the... Injure certain nerves. What nerves you are going to injure? You are going to injure the promontory plexus. Okay, you are going to injure the promontory plexus. 
if you are going to injure this now pelvic plexus by all these plexus what happens is they can cause sexual and bladder dysfunctions they are going to cause sexual and bladder dysfunction that is what we are going to we are going to discuss if you are going to understand this basic concept okay now i will tell you okay so what is going to be the basic principle distal margin has to be more than 2 cm and your proximal margin proximal margin must be more than 5 cm okay if the tumor location is more than 5 cm from your anal verge you it's very easy you perform lower anterior resection plus colo anal okay you perform colo anal anastomosis colo anal anastomosis and you will be sp sparing your sphincters sparing the sphincters okay but what are the structures you are going to remove here you are going to remove rectum along with rectum you are going to remove part of sigmoid you are going to remove part of sigmoid you are going to remove part of sigmoid but if it is going to be less than 5 cm from anal verge if the tumor is going to be less than 5 cm from your anal verge what are you going to do you can you have to perform not the lar that you are not going to perform lower anterior resection instead you are going to perform abdominal peritoneal resection peritoneal resection is performed that is going to be a apr that is your apr along with apr what you will do you have to do a permanent you will do permanent end colostomy you will do permanent end colostomy by cutting the sphincter so your sphincter is going to be injured you are going to cut the sphincter so you are going to remove a rectum anal canal also so rectum anal canal also you have to remove and what you have to do you cannot do any uh, anastomosis and all here you are going to keep a stoma so you are going to mainly keep stoma that is going to be permanent end colostomy okay permanent end colostomy has to be performed you don't have a choice okay wow. so eye ligation okay now you have to understand uh, what are going to what is going to be trans anal total mesorectal excision this can be asked as a question i'll tell you what is going to be trans anal total mesorectal excision trans anal mesorectal excision of dinana trans anal mesorectal excision it is going to be a local surgery this is actually a part of your notes. What is notes? It is a oral. Okay. So oral route la panna kudiya surgeries. Nama paathirukko nariya nama already paathom. Myotomi unna paathom. So adh illa me vandhu notes procedures. Okay va. Same way non-invasive oral procedures la you are going to have this trans anal total mesorectal excision. So this is done in the early rectal cancer. This is done in early rectal cancer. Early rectal cancer cancer that is going to be in your t1 t2 in a t1 t2 and sphincter preserving surgery it is a sphincter preserving surgery preserving surgery it is a sphincter preserving surgery and what is the concern for you concern is going to be number one urethral injury number one you're going to have a urethral injury and number two multifocal recurrence multifocal recurrence multifocal recurrence are going to be there so what is going to be a plane of dissection total mesenteric mesorectal excision you can do this can injure several nerves if it is going to be beyond the plane if you are going to go beyond the plane there can be several nerves that can be injured so what you have to do is you have to be very careful while doing a procedure for example you have to perform a eye inferior mesenteric artery ligation when you are going to perform eye ligation of your inferior mesenteric artery common injury that can occur is going to be to your superior hypogastric plexus hypogastric plexus superior hypogastric plexus that is going to be near the sacral promontory sacral promontory promontory okay this can result in this can result in retrograde ejaculation this can result in retrograde ejaculation Okay, wow. retrograde ejaculation. This will be going to cause retrograde ejaculation. That is very important. Okay, so this can result in retrograde ejaculation. Main idea in the retrograde ejaculation. Where is it? Retrograde ejaculation. Main reason, if you are going to see sympathetic nerve injury. 
So there is going to be a sympathetic nerve injury, which nerves from L1 to L3. From L1 to L3, there can be nerve injury. That nerve injury is going to result in the, okay, that is going to result in the retrograde ejaculation, sexual dysfunction. Same way, second one is going to be division of lateral stalks too close to the pelvic wall. When you're going to divide the lateral stalk, lateral stalks too close to pelvic side wall, pelvic side wall. What happens when you're going to do that? So there can be an injury to the pelvic plexus. Injury to the pelvic plexus and nervi erigentus, nervi erigentus. So they can cause erectile dysfunction, impotence. Again, they can cause erectile dysfunction and impotence. That is very important. And when you're going to perform an anterior dissection, anterior dissection, when you're going to perform anterior dissection, one, two, three. When you're going to perform anterior dissection, there can be involvement of periprostatic, periprostatic plexus, periprostatic plexus that can cause sexual and bladder dysfunction, sexual and bladder dysfunction, sexual and bladder dysfunction. This is very important. And what is going to be the most important prognostic factor? Most important prognostic factor is going to be your lymph node status, lymph node status. It is going to be the most important prognostic factor. And what is going to be your tumor marker? Tumor marker is going to be CEA. Tumor marker is CEA. And metastasis is most common. Metastasis is most common site on the pathona, liver and resection of liver metst improves the survival. So what you are going to perform? You are going to perform resection of this meds. Uh, resection of meds is very important. That can help you in surgery. You have certain trials. Okay, wow. so there are certain trials. I told you TARTME, right? I told you the transoral uh, uh, total mesorectal excision. This is one important thing. You also have certain other uh, trials. Just remember these trials alone. Collar 3, Collar 3 and TALAR trials. TALAR trials. So these two are also upcoming trials which are going, which are being done to access the long-term safety, to access the long-term safety. And you can also go for chemotherapy basically. You can perform chemotherapy basically. What are the chemotherapy? Can go for fall fox regimen. Fall fox regimen. What is fall fox regimen? Fluoro, 5 fluorouracil, folinic acid. Okay. O for oxyplatinum. O for oxyplatinum. Fall fox. Okay. Well, this is fall fox regimen. And what is your fall fury? Fall fury is 5 fluorouracil. Folinic acid and irononectum. Okay, these are certain uh, other chemotherapeutic agent. Radiotherapy, remember, radiotherapy you can perform only in case of rectal cancer. Okay, Angiyo and the neoadjuvant before radiation. Neoadjuvant you can perform, that's all. Okay, wow. so this is going to give a neo adjuvanta. You can give that all that you have to remember. That's all. This is a very important thing. Then comes to immunotherapy. You can also go for immunotherapy. What are the immunotherapy options you have? Number one, bevacizumab. Number two, cetuximab. Number three, panitumumab. Panitumumab. This is going to act against. EGRF, going to act against EGRF. Then you have Pembrolizumab, Pembrolizumab. All these things, Pembrolizumab is going to be PDL1 inhibitor, PDL1 inhibitor. Okay, this you need to understand. Now, last but not least, we are going to talk about the final part of your cancers. That is going to be your anal cancers. Very short anal cancers. We are going to discuss it. Within next five minutes, we can complete this whole topic, anal cancer. Anal cancer, this is going to be usually squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma, this usually squamous cell carcinoma. Rarely they can be adenocarcinoma. Rarely they can be adenocarcinoma. Okay, wow. so this adenocarcinoma, you will manage it very similar to that of like your rectal cancer. Like your rectal cancer, what you will do in rectal cancer? You go for adenoperito abdominal peritoneal uh, resection and uh, colostomy. Okay, they can perform a colostomy. So, undermining a panirla, rarely adenocarcinoma. If it is going to be squamous cell carcinoma, most commonly it is going to be due to HPV virus 
and the management is going to be your Negro syndrome, Negro regimen. This is what I have put in the index. So Negro regimen, what is going to be? This is going to be a combined chemo radiation. Combined chemo radiation. This is going to be a combined chemo radiation. So what you're going to do in the combined chemo radiation? What is going to be the combined chemo radiation you're going to give? You can go for 5-fluorouracil or you can go for mitomycin along with this you are going to go radiotherapy for 35 gyre okay this is going to given for one month period if residual is present if residual is there okay if residual is there you go for surgery what surgery abdominal peritoneal resection okay with this we are actually completing and finally next uh, one, one short thing which we are going to discuss is these proctoscopes this is going to be your colostomy bag and this is going to be the resection in the rectal cancer what you're going to do and this is what i wanted to tell you okay so you can perform a digital rectal examination at what position you will perform a digital rectal examination at sims position i want you to remember that so digital Rectal examination is performed at Sims position. Sims position and a left lateral position. This is left lateral position. This is your left lateral position. Okay. And right index you are going to use. Right index is used. And in adult, in children, you will use little finger. In children, you will use little finger. In children and adult, you will use a uh, adult and you will use index finger okay so external examination whenever you're going to perform a digital uh, examination what all you're going to see is number one any external hemorrhoids is there you're going to see whether there is a fistula then there is a fissure okay fissure you cannot insert your uh, index finger into the rectum okay wow. so rectal examination panna so first you have to go for external examination once after rectal external examination Okay, just imagine this is going to be your rectum. This is going to be the anterior part of rectum and this is going to be a posterior part of rectum. What you are going to do is, first you are going to see, once you are going to see, you are going to insert through your posterior aspect. Posterior aspect, la first right, uh, your index finger insert. Pandrenga. Insert, pandrenga. first you are going to see down. So, it's any fecal accumulation of irukan pakrenga. So, adi irukan patha the kapra angin abdiye, you are going to twist your finger and go like this. Okay, then adi maya are going to come back. Okay, come go like this and come back. In the anterior aspect, la yedu kuporna rendu visho. One, you have to check for the prostrate. Okay, prostrate feel panano. And second thing is going to be in the pouch of Douglas, you are going to feel. And in females now, on the cervix, try to feel cervix in the females. So this is going to be your uh, digital examination. And this is your anoscope. Anoscope is going to be 10 centimeter. Proctoscope is going to be 13 centimeters usually. And this is rectoscope, which is 25 centimeter. Okay, this is going to be 25 centimeters. So with this, we are completing the today's session. And in the next session, we will be discussing about the hemorrhoids, piles, etc. So day 8 to the, probably we will be completing the GAT along with liver. So we will try to cover the remaining part of your rectum. That is, we have only small topic, hemorrhoids. So hemorrhoids, murchasana, rectal prolapse. So those two are the important topic. And you have pylonidal abscess. Okay, you have this perianal fistula. Okay, then you have this rectal prolapse. Once we complete those if you have small, small topics, we will go for liver. We will try to complete liver in the next discussion. Eighth topic, liver in complete. Okay, thank you. Bye.